So when we talk about the late Roman Empire and the transition from that empire into early medieval Europe, one of the key things we have to understand is Christianity. So Christianity becomes very crucial for understanding the intellectual shift in medieval Europe for war justification and a culture of war in general because we get things like warrior saints, warrior monks, people that are, you know, looked at in Christianity, or the Christianity of this period anyway, as being divine leaders in war. And because the bishop, and we're going to talk about this in later videos, because the bishop is the leader of the church, and because the bishop is the guy that understands saints, in medieval warfare, when there's a bishop on the field, well then, the saints on the field. So the soldiers are granted divine protection. They are granted, you know, victory through God. So this is what we have to talk about in the next couple videos, is Christianity and its impact on warfare, the late Roman Empire, and early medieval Europe. So I got this little poem, well, part of a poem anyway, up on the screen, and it's going to become apparent why I have it up there in a few minutes, but it reads, and now what will become of us without the barbarians? Those people were some kind of a solution. So, this applies very strongly to the Roman and the Persian empires for the following reason. So these cultures, these empires, were inherently agricultural. These people farmed. They grew their food. The antithesis to both of these empires was the nomad. This is the key military and the key ideological threat. But when we talk about nomads, we have to clarify something. The Romans and the Persians did not mean the desert nomads, Berbers, Arabs, etc. These people were far too weak. They could not muster the numbers needed to actually do anything serious in terms of damage to either state. What they're talking about when they talk about nomads as being the core threat are the northern nomads, so the Huns, Sarmatians, eventually the Turks and Avars, people that come from the steppe. These are the main ideological threat in the late Roman Empire, taxes, and it justifies its heavily centralized rule via this ever-present threat. These are the people beyond the border that the state needs to fight. So in order to do that, it needs a strong military, it needs taxes, etc. So this is how they get around justifying all this stuff. However, to the nomads of the steppe, the Roman Central European frontier, this, you know, place that is nominally divided by the Rhine and the Danube rivers, not really a frontier. This is a frontier in name only. The reality is that the Romans and the Central Europeans have a very, very long, very drawn-out history of conflict and cooperation. Many of them want to be part of the Roman world, and we see this through the, you know, trading of Roman goods. A lot of Roman stuff shows up across that frontier zone. A lot of Germanic goods, not only armor, but pottery, things like that, are crafted in the Roman style. Many, many barbarians, many people living in this area, come across the frontier to marry soldiers stationed in forts. They bring their families over to settle farmland, to move into villages, things like that. This is an area that's very, very interconnected. But to the Romans, these are still barbarians. These are still people that, to them, they have to justify fighting like we've been going over. To the steppe nomads, this frontier is not really a frontier. Both sides are green. It's broken only by a handful of rivers. When the Central European people, whatever you want to call them, barbarian or otherwise, when they come under threat by the people from the steppe, they are reminded very clearly and very quickly which cultural side, which zone they're really on, which is the agricultural side, the agricultural zone, so they're on the Roman side. So when attacks by people like the Huns and the Sarmatians happen, these guys want to integrate themselves into the Roman Empire. But this causes a problem. Ostensibly, this can't really happen because to the Romans, these are barbarians. These are the people that exist to justify the Romans' own existence. However, Christianity starts changing this. It's a Eurasian-wide religion. This, this faith spreads from 
the Near East out into what is today Spain, what is today Scotland and Scandinavia, as far east as Central Asia and Siberia. There are many different variants of this thing. Originally, we have you know stuff like Monarchianism, which is a branch of Christianity that develops into its own kind of religion. We have, uh, you know, Catholicism, Greek Orthodoxy. The list is probably endless. Arian Christianity. There are many different varieties, and they're adopted by both the Romans and the Central Europeans. And because they're adopted by them. Even though there are different variants of Christianity, the religion unites everybody. So it causes this intellectual shift. The rhine Danube frontier is no longer the frontier, because the people on both sides are Christian. It's not like you're a barbarian and you're a Roman. That divide doesn't exist anymore. Everybody is a Christian, so the population becomes united. So the frontier zone gets pushed. It gets pushed outward to... Ireland, to Scotland, Scandinavia, Russia, etc. That's where the frontier zone is. So when these people stop being barbarians to the Romans, well, then the justification for the Roman state kind of goes by the wayside. So what becomes of us now that there are no longer any barbarians? How does the Roman state justify its existence? And the answer is, in the West, it doesn't. So, the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, we tend to think of this thing as like this big, drawn-out event made up of battles, economic problems, population dislocation, but we think of it as a series of events. This is not an event. At all. The collapse of the Western Roman Empire is a process more than anything else, and it's best looked at as a process of unhistoric acts. This is something that comes from a series of books and papers by a scholar named Guy Housel, and basically what he's talking about is that the average person doesn't have any, you know, written or archaeological remnants of their life. So when these individual people make individual acts, it causes a ripple effect that is unrecorded, that affects everything. So maybe maybe one year, I don't know, you don't pay your taxes. Well, maybe next year, you're less likely to pay. Okay, that by itself is like not necessarily a problem. But as time goes on, maybe the village stops paying taxes. And you see how that could quickly snowball. Maybe you choose to manufacture local goods. You're less likely to buy from elsewhere. Well, that hurts the Roman-wide economy. The result is a gradual unweaving of the Roman system. So when it's gone, what survives? And the answer is Christianity and a vague idea of Romanness. So the Central Europeans are newcomers. They typically arrive excluding things like the Gothic migration. They typically appear to have arrived in relatively small numbers. What this means, according to Peter Brown in his book, The Rise of Western Christendom, is that this is a victory of what he calls local Romanness. So the empire breaks down. The newcomers, the barbarians, set up their state. But in order to really govern it, they need to work with local aristocrats. So we see the rise of, you know, nominally small local states. This idea of local Roman polities. These people still speak Latin until someone else from another local Roman area, a smaller successor kingdom, comes along and says, well, no, you don't speak Latin anymore. You speak French, you speak Spanish, you speak insert Romance language here. So this is what's going on. So you have this weird blend of culture. Well, what ties these people together? And the answer, among many other things, is Christianity. So that frontier, that idea that you have Roman and barbarian, begins to break down, and it gets pushed out. So, in the intellectual climate, the intellectual current of this era, what we see, in part because of the impact of Christianity, is this idea of, I don't live in Rome, I don't live on the frontier zone, I don't live in France, I don't live in this, you know, insert country here, I live in Europe, I live in Christendom, the area, the region of Christianity. So that idea becomes so pervasive that 
it's going to start impacting how war is conducted and how war is justified. Now, going along with this, to be a soldier in the late Roman Empire, ostensibly, was to be a barbarian. But it was also to be a Christian. So here we have, you know, again, this blending of Roman ideas, barbarian ideas, military stuff, and Christianity. So we see a fusing of ideas and warfare becomes backed up intellectually via Christian writings. Hopefully this has been a fairly broad overview of this thing for you. In the next couple of videos, what we're going to be talking about is the shift in Roman and barbarian identity to a nominally Christian one and the rise of warrior monks, warrior saints, warrior bishops, the role of bishops on the battlefield, how bishops and priests fight, stuff like that. So that's where we're going from here. So until then, I will see you all next time.